Hello students, welcome to this class. In this class, we will be trying to understand a very interesting field of psychology that is parapsychology. Now, parapsychology can be defined as the study of paranormal phenomena or extrasensory perception, that is perception which cannot be accounted for by our five physical senses. The term parapsychology is derived from the German word parapsychology, as you can see on the screen, which means psychical research or something referring to psychic or mental processes. Now the term parapsychology to refer to paranormal phenomena and extrasensory perception was first coined by Max Desire. However, the term was popularized to a large extent by J.B. Ryan and he used the term in 1937 in his book New Frontiers of the Mind in which he put forward the large amount of parapsychological research that was being conducted at Duke University. J.B. Ryan can be seen as the single most influential person who popularized the field of parapsychology to a large extent. He in fact was the person who started the first autonomous laboratory of parapsychology at Duke University. This laboratory later, under the guidance of noted anthropologist Margaret Mead, became affiliated with the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, which is in fact the greatest scientific society in the world. J.B. Ryan also started the first journal of parapsychology which he co-edited with William McDougall and with the passage of time the Parapsychological Association was created at Durham in North Carolina. Now in recent times parapsychological research has been supported and augmented with a number of other fields such as transpersonal psychology which deals with the transcendental or spiritual aspects of our daily lives or of our thinking and behavior. It has also been supported by another new field that is anomalistic psychology which deals with all kind of paranormal beliefs and subjective paranormal or out-of-the-world experiences that many people have. Now in this lesson, we will be trying to have a brief overlook of certain terms which are of great importance in parapsychology and which you will be coming across a number of times as you study parapsychology. The first is extrasensory perception. Extrasensory perception is a term which first came to use around 1934 and it refers to perception that is gained through means other than the five physical senses of vision, hearing, touch, taste and smell. This term was coined by Rudolf Tischner and later it was popularized to a large extent by Rhine, his wife Louisa Rhine and their associates. And extrasensory perception includes clairvoyance, it also includes telepathy which in fact is a part of clairvoyance and it also includes the transtemporal aspects or applications of clairvoyance and telepathy that is precognition and retrocognition. Now let us see what is clairvoyance. Clairvoyance is derived from the 17th century French word clair meaning clear and voyance meaning vision. A person having clairvoyance is generally seen or referred to as a clairvoyant. Having clairvoyance means that that person can gain knowledge about objects, events, persons, situations and this he can gain without the use of any of his physical senses or sensory abilities such as vision, hearing, touch, taste and smell. And the kind of knowledge that he gains cannot be explained in any terms and by physical phenomena or experiences. Now the next parapsychological term we will be dealing with is telepathy. Telepathy is derived from two Greek words, tele meaning distant and pathia meaning to be affected by. And this word was coined by W. H. Myers in 1882. Now, telepathy refers to the transfer of thoughts, feelings or some kind of information between persons which does not involve the use of any kind of physical mechanisms or any kind of operation of the physical sense organs. 
For instance, there have been many cases of telepathy recorded. I would like to just relate to you one case study. A woman from a rural area who lived in a village in the early 70s without having any form of communication such as telephone and she did not have even telegraph system or postal system available, it would take months and days in those days. One of her sons was studying in Italy for some course and this woman on one particular day says, starts crying suddenly and says that there is something wrong with my son, something has happened to my son and the people around her comfort her and some are even amused and make fun of her as to why is she behaving in this way because there is no means by which she could have got any kind of information regarding her son who was thousands of miles away. Now a month later, that is the time it used to take for communication to happen in those days, a telegram arrives from Italy saying that on that particular day when that lady felt so anxious and worried and at that particular time her son had met with a serious accident in Italy and one month later he was recovering. Now this exactly is telepathy because there could have been no means by which this lady could have known about what was happening to her son and yet she knew about it. This involves the transfer of thoughts, feelings and information without the use of any kind of physical mechanism or any kind of physical source or sense mechanisms and hence involves telepathy. The study of parapsychology also involves precognition or knowing about things in advance. Actually precognition is taken from the Latin word pre meaning prior to and cognitio meaning acquiring knowledge. Now, precognition means that a person knows a lot about what is going to happen, whether with regard to objects, events or persons, and he has no other means or physical means of determining this information or getting this information. Take the case study of a person X who many days in advance begins finishing his duties, meeting all the people necessary and even when people give him certain assignments beyond a particular date, he rejects those assignments and says that someone else will do it because I will no longer be able to do it. And say five days later on that particular day, beyond which he was not ready to take any kind of assignment, now the person meets with a severe accident which leads to his death. Now, this is an actual case study which has occurred in the study of parapsychology, which meant that the person had a sense of precognition or had a sense of prior knowledge about his imminent death, although there was no means by which he could have actually gained the information. He was not sick or he was not in any way expecting something fatal to happen to him. So this is what involves precognition. Now we come to yet another term in parapsychology that is psychokinesis. Now psychokinesis is derived from the two Greek words UK meaning mind, heart, soul or breath even and kinesis or movement or motion. And it is also sometimes referred to as telekinesis and abbreviated as either PK referring to psychokinesis or TK referring to telekinesis. Now in this phenomenon of psychokinesis, the person can actually bring about changes in various physical phenomena or physical objects using his mental powers and energies and without exerting any kind of physical energy or physical manipulation on the object. Now we have several experiments conducted on mind power where people can actually move objects or bring about dents or some kind of twisting of even metal objects using only their mind without touching or without manipulating the object in any known way. So this is what comprises psychokinesis. Now yet another area that parapsychology studies is general ESP. Now general ESP involves the occurrence of extrasensory perception along with its many variants such as telepathy, clairvoyance or both. Now a term that we will see now is the term Psi because it is used to refer primarily to the field of parapsychology and many psychologists do have taken it to symbolize their field. Now the Psi comprises the 23rd letter of the Greek alphabet meaning Suke that is mind or soul and it was first projected or coined by Bertold Wessner. Now there are two types of Psi that are studied in parapsychology. The first is Psi Gamma. It refers to paranormal cognition, that is extrasensory perception 
or its variants such as telepathy and clairvoyance because it mainly involves cognition or the acquisition or gaining of knowledge or the transfer of thinking. The second variant of Psi is the Psi Kappa. The Psi Kappa pertains to paranormal action and paranormal movement and hence includes under it psychokinesis. Now other facets that parapsychology also deals with are near-death experiences or the experiences of a person who was clinically dead or brain dead or who saw death from very close quarters. So what were the kind of experiences that he felt is a subject of study of parapsychology? Another subject of parapsychological study is reincarnation or the rebirth of a soul or some other non-physical aspect or attribute from a past birth into the physical body of the person in his present birth. Parapsychology also deals with apparitional experiences which is often attributed to the appearance of ghosts or spirits or some other such phenomena either related to a dead person or his belongings. Now the very fact that parapsychology comes within the purview of psychology is because it has allowed itself to be subjected to some kind of experimental research and testing. So we can automatically deduce that parapsychological phenomena can also be tested or measured in some way. Now we will be briefly dealing with what are the various ways of measuring parapsychological phenomena. First, we come to Zener's cards which were developed by Carl Zener and J.B. Ryan. Now earlier, all kinds of parapsychological testing were based upon a standard deck of playing cards. The cards would be overturned and the person would be asked to guess as to what the next card is. And a correct guess would involve both guessing the number as well as the suit of the card. Now this not only made the task very difficult but also it created a lot of ambiguity because people already had a lot of experience with playing cards and they used to prefer certain cards more than the other. And this preference could also be seen in the parapsychological experiment because after every second or third trial they would say again the nine of spades or the queen of hearts because they had a personal liking for those cards. So it was required that a more systematic system of investigation of extrasensory perception be evolved. And hence, Carl Zenner and J.B. Ryan put forward the Zenner's cards. Now the Zenner's card consists of five basic symbols. Each symbol is printed on each card. These five symbols are a circle, zero, as you can see on the screen, a Greek cross, certain vertical wavy lines, a hollow square, and a hollow five-point star or David star. And the number of Zener's cards is 25, five each belonging to each symbol. And these cards are overturned and the subject is asked to guess as to what the symbol on the next card is. A correct guess is referred to as psi hitting and an incorrect guess is referred to as psi missing. Now each guess constitutes a trial and when all the 25 cards are presented, it constitutes a run. And since each symbol appears five times in a deck of cards, the probability of the subject guessing is taken to be one into five or one fifth of the total number of cards. And if the degree of psi hits or correct guesses exceeds this kind of chance probability, num this kind of number which can be derived on the basis of chance probability, and when this kind of phenomenon of exceeding the chances of guessing occurs across a number of trials, say hundreds or thousands of trials across a number of people, then we can say that probably the kind of guessing the person does is not just based on chance but involves some kind of extrasensory perception or extrasensory understanding. Now instead of the Zener's cards, at times picture cards are also used and these are overturned, the person is not told what the picture is and he is given a blank sheet of paper and asked to draw a picture which can to the greatest extent resemble the picture which is still unknown to him and various aspects of resemblance in this picture and the picture which was not shown or which was kept hidden from him as compared to see to the extent to which the person can perceive phenomena which are still not revealed to him. Now based on nearly 90,000 trials of Zener's cards, Ryan and his associates felt that extrasensory perception was something which was real and which could also be demonstrated in an experimental situation. 
However, there were a number of critics. Say, for example, there was the critic Milburn Christopher, who was an illusionist, and he felt there were dozens of ways which people being tested by the Zenner's cards could actually deceive or cheat the experimenter. And there was another major critic, that is Irving Langmuir, who said that Ryan actually indulged in selective reporting. He reported only those cases where there was a greater chance of psi hitting or there was a greater notion of extrasensory perception, whereas he withheld those cases where no kind of extrasensory perception was observed. Now, once Ryan retired in 1965, the entire administration of Duke University, where Ryan had actually formed the basis of parapsychology, became less interested in the entire research regarding parapsychological phenomena, and slowly the research in Duke University died out. Later, Ryan established his own foundation, that is the foundation for research on the nature of man, and on the centenary of Ryan's birth in 1995, it was renamed as Ryan Research Center. And this is one center where parapsychological research still continues today, even though modern psychology is extremely skeptical about what parapsychological research comprises and its validity and reliability. In recent times, a number of other techniques for experimentation in parapsychology have also been developed. One of the major techniques is the Gansfeld experiment. In the Gansfeld experiment, the individuals are tested for telepathic abilities. This is done by first creating an environment of mild sensory deprivation for the person who is about to receive the so-called telepathic message. This deprivation may be done by providing a soft red light and putting ping pong balls over the eyes of the person. And even on an auditory level, he is made to hear white noise so that the stimulation is very less. And the person is also made to recline in a chair where the sense of touch is minimal. Once this is achieved, another person at another location is shown a picture and is told to try to send this picture to this person who is in a state of sensory deprivation at a totally different location. And for 20 to 40 minutes, this process goes on where the sensory deprived person is asked to express whatever comes to his mind freely, like thoughts, feelings, and images. And after this period, the sensory deprived person is shown a series of pictures and he has to identify the correct picture which was supposed to be sent by the other person in the other location to him. Now, if he can identify this picture, now if he can correctly identify this picture beyond a certain level of chance probability, then it can be said that there was some sort of a telepathic communication between the sensory deprived person and the other person in the other location who telepathically communicated this picture to him. Now, experiments by noted parapsychological experimenters like Diane Dryden have shown that the Gansfield experiment and its documentation of the telepathic conveyance of information is far above chance factors and it indicates the true probability of the existence of telepathic abilities. Certain other experimental techniques are also used. We will be going over some of them. One is the direct mental interaction with living systems in which two people in two different locations try to interact. Say, for example, a person in a particular location, through his intentions, tries to bring about psychophysiological changes in the state of another person at another location. One common experiment is that of staring. A person in a location tries to stare on a mental basis on another person. Now, this person on whom he is staring is not in front of him. He is at a totally another location. And this person at the other location who is being stared at is asked as to what kind of feelings he has. If he reports the kind of discomfort we normally feel when someone stares at us, then there is an evidence that in spite of distance and in spite of the fact that no other physical phenomena can account for it, still a person's intentions at a different location can be felt by another person at a totally different location. Studies have also tried to analyze near-death experiences in people who experience near-death circumstances such as becoming clinically dead or brain dead. And a number of experiences such as a sense of being dead, seeing 
themselves lying on a cot and seeing themselves as dead, an out of body experience, a sensation of floating above one's body and seeing other family members, a sense of seeing a tunnel or a narrow passageway, a sense of overwhelming love and peace, meeting other relatives and friends or parents who had died earlier are some of the kind of reports that people having near-death experiences give when parapsychologists analyze these experiences later on. Another interesting feature analyzed is that of reincarnation and parapsychologists on the basis of their research have put forward that Memories of earlier births are reported by children most probably among the ages of 3 and 7 and that these memories and these reports are in fact very accurate even when the child and the person of the deceased family whom the child claims to be a reincarnation of have not met each other. This in fact states that there is a possibility for different thoughts, feelings and attributes of a person being passed on from one life to the other. Also kinds of birthmarks or developmental disabilities are seen to be formed in children at those locations where the fatal injury or wound causing death in the previous birth occurred. Now the study of parapsychology peaked during the 1970s and 1980s. A number of related organizations to parapsychology were formed including the Academy of Parapsychology and Medicine, the Institute of Parascience, the Academy of Religion and Psychical Research and the Institute of Noetic Sciences as well as the International Kirlian Research started during this period. One major psychiatrist who engaged in a study of reincarnation during this period was Ian Stevenson and then there was Thelma Moss who devoted a great deal of research to the area of Kirlian photography or photography which was seen to reveal the aura in each human being. With the surge or with the progress of parapsychology during these times, in 1985 a chair of parapsychology was established in the Department of Psychology at the University of Edinburgh and was headed by Robert Morris. After the 1980s, the study of parapsychology and the interest in it declined and, Robert, and after Robert Morris, the chair has remained empty since. If you take the condition of parapsychology today, we will see that parapsychological research is conducted in almost 30 different countries including India and most of the research is conducted in private institutions and organizations or they are separate funded units in various psychology departments. Parapsychological research is most active today in the United Kingdom whereas in the United States with a lot of criticism towards parapsychology and a focus on true empiricism, the interest in parapsychology has gone down as compared to the 1970s. Whereas a small number of parapsychological research articles have appeared in mainstream journals, most of parapsychological research can be seen to be isolated to its own journals and some of the major journals of parapsychology include number one, the Journal of Parapsychology, number two, the Journal of Near-Death Studies, third, a journal of consciousness studies, fourth, the journal of the society of psychical research and lastly, the journal of scientific exploration. Critics of this field of parapsychology feel that any kind of chance successes in this field which actually provides evidence that parapsychology is a real phenomena can be explained in terms of chance successes and in terms of various degrees of cheating or error. And many scientists today regard parapsychology as a pseudoscience or a false science which is not a science at all and they totally reject the concept of extrasensory perception. However, parapsychologists even today continue their research in the field despite the fact that almost for over a century now they have not been able to get any kind of conclusive evidence that can ratify their field. Yet it becomes interesting to know of such a field in psychology because most of all it emphasizes on the fact that psychology could in fact apply experimental procedures and empirical techniques to a high extent even for phenomena which were beyond physical explanation or which were beyond conscious awareness. <laughs>